So I'll tell you a, a, a couple of stories. In 1820, a 61-year-old Ohio blacksmith with uh, no more than $70 worth of property to his name uh, made a startling admission in court. I was on board the East India Company's ships in the harbor of Boston and assisted in throwing the tea overboard on the 18th of December in the year A.D. 1773, being then 15 years of age. So his memory was a little fuzzy. He was off by two days. The Boston Tea Party took place on the 16th. But Joshua Wyeth had just done what no more than four or five people had ever done before. Uh, he confessed to having participated in the Boston Tea Party. Wyeth went on to describe his participation in the battles of Bunker Hill, Brooklyn, Harlem Heights, and White Plains, uh, a somewhat typical career for someone from Massachusetts who had joined the war early on. Uh, and he was attempting to gain a pension from the United States government, which had never uh, up to that time uh, adequately rewarded the uh, revolutionary soldiers for their service. Um, but Wyeth's testimony still leaves us with questions, right? Why had the Boston Tea Party happened? Why did Wyeth himself join in? How did all this lead to the American Revolution? And if it was so important, sure. Um, and if it was so important, why had it uh, why did it stayed secret for almost 50 years? Uh, so the Boston Tea Party, I think, has tons of surprises that I tried to illuminate in my book. Fifteen years after this court appearance, so around in 1835, Wyeth was able to tell his story in more detail in a story that wound up in the newspapers. He talked of the indignation that he and his associates felt about political issues in Boston. Uh, legal tea uh, bore a tax or a duty imposed by Parliament uh, under the Townsend Acts in 1767. And to protest uh, this law, the American colonists had entered into non-importation agreements as a way of convincing the British how much they needed the Americans. By 1770, New York City and Philadelphia were exclusively drinking smuggled tea from continental Europe. But in Boston, while smugglers were doing some of the importing, there was plenty of legal tea still entering the New England market. And the, 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 these agreements really had to be universal in order to work. So when the non-importation agreements collapsed in the summer of 1770, many of the radical patriots in the middle colonies blamed Boston for failing to keep up their end of the bargain. And these resentments were still lingering in 1773. Now, the Tea Act of 1773 didn't levy any new taxes. What it gave was a tax break uh, on tea shipped to America uh, and allowed the East India Company to ship the tea directly, which it didn't have the privilege of doing before, rather than having to go to, through a British or American merchant house. So let me get back to Wyeth's statement. He said, our indignation was increased by having heard of the arrival of the tea ships. These were three merchant ships uh, that had 340 chests of tea on board, uh, which belonged to the East India Company and was designated for sale in New England. Uh, a fourth ship ran aground on the back of Cape Cod. Uh, three other ships were headed to New York City, Philadelphia, and Charleston. In all four of these uh, seaports, the Sons of Liberty, the radicals, wanted this tea sent back to London. But the ship owners couldn't just turn their ships around with dutiable goods aboard without having their cargo seized. Uh, still in New York City and Philadelphia, the radicals were successfully able to pressure the tea consignees, the ship owners, and the local officials into sending the tea back to London. In Boston, the consignees were like, no way, I want my commission, so they refused to resign. Uh, the customs officers and the governor were like, no way, we're not looking the other way, you've got to land this tea. Um, and they wouldn't let the ships turn around and go back to England. So Wyeth said, we agreed that if the tea was landed, the people could not withstand the temptation, right? The tea was going to be cheaper. This was going to, you know, it was going to seduce Americans. Um, and they would certainly buy it. Um, so radical politicians were arguing that this was a way to just seduce Americans into paying taxes for which they hadn't given consent, right? No taxation without representation. So writers in New York City and Philadelphia were warning Americans what would happen if they allowed the tea to land. If Americans conceded Parliament's right to tax the colonies without their consent, the Americans would be no better than, quote, helpless Asiatics uh, who were suffering at the hands of the East India Company. Other writers added that if Americans accepted this monopoly on tea, further monopolies would be sure to follow, right? So the slippery slope argument is f uh, at the forefront of their minds. Uh, John Dickinson, who you may have heard of, uh, wrote under a pen name, and he said, if it's not the paltry sum of three pence, which is now demanded of us, right, this tea, uh, this tea tax that had been imposed in 1767, he said, it's the principle upon which it's demanded that we are contending against.